Hello, everybody. I'm Julie Carter, Professor Emeritus and Nurse Practitioner at Oregon Health and Science University. And I'd just like to welcome and thank all of you for uh, attending our final session for a four-part series for care partners of people with Parkinson's disease. I just want you to know that if you have missed previous sessions and would like to, to see them, they're all available for the last two years on the WPC website. Uh, we've had really good feedback. We, we really think you'd enjoy them. Now, before I get started with today's program, I, do, I would like to acknowledge that we, we remain in a pretty uncertain time when it comes to COVID. Um, and we, we acknowledge that it's even harder for people in the care partner roles. That, um, and I think that's because the issues of isolation and being unable to really access your, your support networks is, is actually harder um, during COVID. And we want you to know that you're not alone. We have a lot to offer you at the WPC. And if you um, have any questions or want to talk to somebody, you can always call the WPC hotline. You can also access the website for all kinds of incredible resources. So you're not alone. We're here for you. And we really hope we have something that will um, be of, of support and comfort for you today. Um, I also want to remind our listeners that um, really all of you out there come from a different place, both physical, not only physically, but emotionally and experientially. Some of you have lived with, with Parkinson's disease for a very long time. Some of you are very new to this journey. So um, we, because of that, we've really designed these workshops or these panels to have a care partner who is has uh, lived with Parkinson's for a longer period of time and one for a shorter period of time. And as if you've been, if you're very seasoned, some of this information may be um, stuff you already know, but, but please uh, understand that there will be things that are new to you. And um, we're really looking forward to this panel. So let me tell you a little bit about the panel. Um, the name of our, this session is Maintaining Closeness, Sexuality, Intimacy, and Ever-Changing Relationships. And this, this session has really been designed to be very an open discussion on a somewhat taboo subject. People still have um, a lot of difficulty talking about sexuality and intimacy, especially when it's personal. Um, this session has been identified to really uh, talk about the motor and non-motor symptoms with, in the person with Parkinson's that affects intimacy. We also have really identified um, things in the care partner, emotional changes, fatigue, depression, those, are, those sorts of, um, of symptoms, if you will, that, that affect the care partner. Um, and on top of that, all the lifestyle changes that have occurred with COVID-19. So you'll see a wonderful panel today, uh, some professional input, as well as two care partners who will share with you some of their own uh, journey and their strategies for maintaining closeness in, um, in the face of a chronic illness. One other, a couple of other things before I introduce our panel members. The first thing is that if you, if for some reason you have to end our um, session early, in the upper right hand corner of your screen is a button that says survey. Um, please, please take it anyway. It's a very short survey, but a very valuable survey to us. We, um, we, we look at it very closely. We have utilized some of the, um, some of the things we've seen in our, uh, in planning our other sessions. Um, and the other thing is that you can start chatting in the chat box, writing your questions at any time, even while the panelists are speaking, um, so that we have those available to us when we end the sessions and, um, and we'll take the bulk of those questions after the panel has all spoken. I probably will ask each panel member one question just to um, at the end of each of their talks, but the bulk will be at the end. So with that, I'd like to welcome our three panelists. Um, 
Our first panelist is Dr. Marianne Mazzo. She's a nurse practitioner and retired professor at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center um, College of Nursing in Oklahoma City. And she is um, uh, one of the, I think, very uh, pertinent things for this particular topic is that some of her research, she's an active researcher, but some of her research has involved improving communication about sexual health for adults living with, with serious illness, um, which will be very interesting to hear more about. Um, and then we have two care partner panelists. The first is Ken Hill. He lives in Portland, Oregon, where I reside. He and his cat, his, his um, wife, Kat, um, they are living with Young Onset PD. He works as a full-time IT operations manager for the Oregon Health Authority and spends his volunteer time really supporting other Young Onset PD care partners and their families. They, the two of them have three adult children and a very spirited Yorkshire Terrier who's being kept quiet during this webinar. <laughs> um, our last but not least is Jean Ward. And Jean is a professional life coach and a, cl a clinical hypnotherapist. Her husband of almost 40 years was diagnosed with PD in 2009. Um, and together they've really discovered new ways to keep their passion uh, alive in, in their relationship. And um, just as a, a side, she also uses she, her art um, and uh, marries it with her current, her therapeutic work and runs a program through the British Columbia Brain Wellness Clinic to build and foster brain wellness through creativity. A wonderful, a wonderful endeavor. And, and I have to say uh, thank you to our sponsors before I turn it over to, to Dr. Matzo. Uh, Supernus Pharmaceuticals and Kiowa Kirin, both of these uh, two pharmaceutical companies have, have underwritten our entire series. We would not be here without them and we can't thank them enough for their support. So with no further ado, I'd like to uh, turn this over to Marianne Matzo, who will share her, her expertise around intimacy. Marianne? Hello, and thank you for having me. Uh, I just want to kind of give the overall view of sexuality and intimacy. And really, our sexual selves are a part of our health, it's a part of our well-being. It's a part of our quality of life. If you've ever heard about Maslow and his hierarchy of needs, it's this inverted triangle. And on the bottom are, are the basic needs. And it goes up as, you know, become more, more um, self-actualized, you know, getting up to the top of that pyramid. But on that bottom are the things that we need to stay alive. It's food. It's water. It's air and it's sex. So sex isn't one of those things that, well, it's nice to have it if you can. It's a basic human need. And so being that it's basic to our humanity, we all have our own sexual identity, our own sexual value system, and, and that impacts how we see the rest of the world and how we interact with the world. Human sexuality includes more than hormones and anatomy. Um, it's more than our gender. It reflects how genders relate. And for our purposes today, is, I'm going to define it as aspects of the personality pertaining to sexual orientation, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. And so we have this, you know, we're from the time that, you know, we're babies, we have this, this, this sexual part of ourselves and we develop it as we grow older, we grow older. And in our relationships that develops, and then you're in a situation where there's a diagnosis of a chronic disease in one of the care part, one of the partners, and there may be a change in, how 
they see themselves, how you see yourself as a care partner, how they're interacting with children and with other people. And you say to yourself, well, this is how it was. Is this how it's always going to be? And what do I need to do to understand this? So sexuality involves more than ourselves. And having other people experience us as sexual beings involves both our social and our biological aspects of our body. Now, sexual health in the context of a serious illness can be directly impacted by the disease, um, by changes in our anatomy, by the medications that we take, and it can change sexual interest or desire. It can change how our body is going to actually function. Is there going to be enough vaginal lubrication? Will man, will the male be able to get and sustain an erection? Um, all of these things are aspects of how your body can change with a serious illness. So sexuality is that capacity of the individual to link their emotional needs with the physical intimacy. Sexuality and the ability to experience intimacy are both quality of life issues. Now, the loss of sexual health can impact overall quality of life and well-being. And for people living with Parkinson's disease, maintaining sexuality and intimacy with a partner continues to be a vital part of life. Sexual intercourse is often a small component of sexuality. I don't know if it's just our culture, or just the United States or, or how we've been brought up. But when you talk about sex, people think, oh, that's sexual intercourse. But if you're in a gay or lesbian relationship, it's not sexual intercourse. Sex has lots of different ways that it's expressed between people. Um, it's sex is that intimate touching or being held as a form of communication, or it could be a coping strategy in grieving changes in health status. Your, your intimacy with a person starts the minute you wake up in the morning and, and you look at each other and you either smile at each other and say good morning or, you know, you grump, get out of bed in your own special way and don't even talk to each other. Your intimacy is set up from the moment that you wake up and how you interact with each other during the day. Are you able to joke with each other? Are you able to tease with each other? How do you you know, care for that person? Is it food that you make? Or is there a change in the role that the care partner has relative to the physical care needed for the person living with Parkinson's? Intimacy is a matter of emotional communication with others and with yourself. It's, it's a disclosure of emotions and action, which the individual is unlikely to share with the public. It's sort of like, this is ours. You know, you don't go out on the street and say, well, let me tell you what we did today. It's not that kind of thing. It's an issue of feelings of trust. Um, and it's just, it's, it's for you. People living with Parkinson's might feel a decrease in self-control, a decreased sense of self. And despite age or physical health, people remain sexual beings and sexual health needs to not end when a person is diagnosed with a serious illness. Now, for some people, some of my patients will say, yep, it's ended and I am thrilled. And if both partners agree with that, then that's OK. That, you know, that's OK. I mean, I'm not giving that permission one way or the other, but it's a sense of, well, are you satisfied in your relationship? Is there that intimacy there that makes you feel loved and valuable? And if that's there, then you say, I'm okay with the other stuff not being there. There can be problems though, when one partner says, oh, thank God, you know, when I'm not gonna do that anymore. And the other partner is saying, oh, wait a minute, what? 
I didn't know that this diagnosis came with this decision on your part that we're not going to do this anymore. You can see where that can be some trouble. So <clears throat> with respect to relationships, um, partners can feel that they're causing pain. You know, like, I don't want to do something to him or to her that's going to be painful. And so I'll just stop doing anything altogether. Um, other problems can occur, like concerns with body image. People will, people will like, why would you even want to look at, look at how my body is now? Um, altered sexual function, relationships issues, feelings of loss and grief relative to the changes that um, your partner has experienced. And, you know, that, that grief and that bereavement is, is real. As part of my research, um, I interviewed and talked with people who had been diagnosed with a serious illness and, about their relationships with their partner since diagnosis. And I, in, in that research came out with sort of positive impacts of the disease on the relationship and negative. So in the positive side, what they said, what they told me is that they grew closer through these adverse events. Um, they had to learn to overcome over communication hurdles that they didn't feel that they had to overcome before, um, that they don't take each other for granted anymore. Um, one person said that they have a more mature relationship, a different form of intimacy, less about physical, but more about loving. There's a stronger bond. Um, one woman said that she had almost died and that she felt as though her husband cherished her more. Um, one other person, one person said they didn't realize how much he had cared until he became the caregiver. And she realized, I guess she always knew that he, he loved her, but she realized how much. And that there was more of a relationship um, with the significant other because of the disease. Negative impacts. Um, communication regarding physical changes. Um, one person said they felt that they were too sick and they did not want to be touched. They were afraid to talk at first. Um, one person said they felt asexual, that they feared intimacy and that the intimacy wasn't as fun or spontaneous as it had been. And just a quote from somebody, I think I have positive and negative changes. And I think that those negative first, because I've had all the complications from medications, I've had all kinds of problems, but through it though, it became very positive. We became very much closer, very close. Uh, another person said, your mindset changes, your body changes, your sex drive changes. It's all in there together. And my psychic change, excuse the word, but I was a bitch for a long time before I got a hold of myself. The lastly, one uh, the last quote I'll read to you is that, and I'll tell you from my experience, that empowered me so much. It was like, ha. Parkinson's. You're not taking this from me. And so in a way, you know, I have to say I wasn't exactly wanting it, you know, like I wasn't in the mood or anything. But this was more of a conscious decision that I was looking in the eye and say, you're not doing this. We can have opportunities for physical intimacy that go beyond intercourse, such as touching, kissing, holding hands, snuggling, massage, oral sex, masturbation. They're all examples of physical intimacy that promotes that feeling of love and connectedness. Our intimacy with our partners can be that wink and the smile that lets them know that there's that a connection between just the two of you. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Um, before we'll we'll have a number of questions afterward, but I just want to ask you one question um, that's it's sort of a, a practical question. Because, but even in the even in the um, situation of Parkinson's disease or other chronic illnesses, 
um, people still have changes that come with aging. And for women, much often that's a feeling of dryness. Do you have any very specific examples or suggestions for women as a starting point? Yes. Um, part of our research, we came out with, um, we asked women what they wanted to know. And they said, we need like an A to Z book. So we wrote an A to Z book. Now this one is about cancer, but it's free. So you can get it. You can download it off the internet and you can go to the part, you know, about um, vaginal dryness. And what we put in here, which you can't see, but I'm telling you it's here. It's on page 36 is looking at the different lubricants and moisturizers. Well, a lot of women don't know, no matter what, is going on. A lot of women don't know that there's a difference between a lubricant and a moisturizer. A lubricant, this is a lube. Before you have intercourse, before you have sex, you would put this on yourself or on your partner so that things would glide in easily. Okay, that's lube. There's moisturizers that because of the changes in our hormones as we grow older and there can be changes related with the medications with Parkinson's also is that your vagina itself gets very, very dry. And so, you know, you moisturize your skin as we get older, we moisturize our face. Who knew you could moisturize your vagina, but you can. And um, this is, this, I, I wish I got money for this, but I don't. This is called Lubina, and it is a vaginal moisturizer and a lubricant. It's a prebiotic. So what it does is it makes that um, the, the vagina healthier. Um, you use it three times a week at night. It's, you use it at night so that it kind of stays in there and does its, does its job. But it'll rehydrate the, the vagina, help keep it healthy, help, help keep the um, normal flora growing in there. Because when, when, when you dry out, the normal stuff that keeps a vagina healthy doesn't grow, can't stay there. Um, but this will keep that environment healthy. So this can really save um, your vaginal health. And when you have good vaginal health, then you're able to have good sexual health. Great. So the, the website, I, I will give it to you. So you can find this on our website. It's www.everyonedies, D-I-E-S. I know we'll go there some other time, but it's www.everyonedies.org. the number one dies.org. And if you go there, um, you'll can find that there. You can download it, print it off on your printer. You can read it on the computer, whatever you want. And we'll actually post that in um, on the notes of this session after after it's all over with. So they don't even have to remember your website. It'll just go to WPC and they'll uh, oh, perfect. The session and they'll find it. Okay, very good. Now um, let me introduce our next panel member, Ken Hill. Um, Ken is going to be um, sharing his experiences with um, intimacy in the in and living with Parkinson's disease and tips for maintaining um, intimacy and closeness. Ken, great, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, if you and also if you see me looking down, it's because I'm scrolling through some notes. I made some bullet points. I, I can't memorize things very well anymore. So just uh, there, there's a brief introduction about my background and um, my role as a care partner. So my wife, Kat, um, we've been married for 31 years. We have three adult children. Um, she was diagnosed with uh, young onset Parkinson's seven plus years ago. And we actually think looking back, like many of us who live in a Parkinson's life, um, probably was, was showing symptoms of Parkinson's way before that several years before that that we attributed to something else that we were trying to find a diagnosis for um her parkinson's she, you know basically she had to stop working she was a nurse practitioner midwife uh for several years uh was a director of a large uh inner city midwifery clinic here in portland oregon 
And so one of the first difficulties that we experienced in Parkinson's was having our incomes uh, reduced by more than half. And I think several of us have had that experience. And so we've had to navigate that. I'm still working full time. Um, I work in IT with uh, the state of Oregon's Oregon Health Authority. And I'm right now the last year and a half been uh, up to my neck with COVID. I deal with the data systems for the COVID response and recovery in the state of Oregon. And so I've been pretty busy uh, the past year and a half. I think um, how it's been recent that I've had to really like think about the impact of intimacy in our relationship with the Parkinson's. Um, and it's, what's been difficult is that there's been impacts to intimacy in our relationship, even before Parkinson's. And as we age, you know, I've noticed that it seems to be, it's hard to, dis, to determine if, is this impact to intimacy because of Parkinson's or is this just part of our natural aging and our relationship process of, you know, we're another year of marriage, another year of marriage. Right. Um, but one thing that I've noticed is um, I, with Parkinson's uh, I've had the experience recently with a medication side effect affecting our intimacy. Um, you know, cat, one of the first medications cat was taking was an a dopamine agonist agonist and, and, Many of you may know, but there there can be some uh, uh, pretty significant uh, impulse control and libido change side effects because of that type of medication. And we experienced that. And uh, it impacted not only our physical intimacy, but also some of our emotional intimacy. Um, we've also had, um, even before Parkinson's, we've had some impacts from intimate intimacy. Our youngest son, who's now, he's now 20, he's 25. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I can't believe that. Uh, he was diagnosed with type one diabetes when he was a youngster at the age of eight. And, and that living with a chronic disease in a family that impacted our intimacy years ago. And we've been able to work through that. Um, and so when cats Parkinson's, uh, came into our lives, it was just kind of like reliving some of these challenges, uh, with our intimacy. I also have had, uh, some personal issues with, with alcoholism and I've been able to, I've been sober for the past 10 years plus years. Um, and that has been a way of, uh, impacted our intimacy and we've worked through it. And a lot of how we've worked through is, is through really focusing on the emotional aspects of intimacy, not necessarily the physical part of it. Um, and one of the things that I've been able to learn is that there are things in my relationship with my wife that are very intimate that are not physical. Like she's told me some of the, Ken, some of the most sexiest things I've seen you do is like when you do the dishes or when you vacuum the family room and doing some chores. That's really one of the most romantic things I you can do for me. Um, and at first I just thought not, it just went way over my head, but now uh, I've, it's been ingrained in our relationship. And so I've been with the Parkinson's and our intimacy uh, been trying to focus more on how can I improve our emotional intimacy Um piece. Um, so that's my creative approach is really f um, the physical intimacy we can address. Uh, we talk about it. Um, but I actually have been able to like with Kat, you know, really try to look back on how things in the past that we used to do that would be very intimate. And it could be, you know, like I said, make, make, cleaning dishes, but even like making each other's lunches, we carve out time to go for walks and hold hands with our, and um, those kinds of pieces um, are just as important. Um, years, if you would have asked me like 10, 15 years ago, I would, that I would not be able to talk about the intimates, uh, the emotional intimacy um, because I just wasn't there. 
with the physical intimacy, I will say I, with COVID, it's been a lot easier because I'm working at home. And so it's, we have had a lot more physical time together. So when we have that physical urge, we can act on it quite easily. I can, you know, whereas before when we were working both far, full time, you know, you had less hours of the day to be intimate. So I, in, in some ways, I kind of am grateful for the, the pandemic, I should say. Um, and I'm just going to wrap up uh, with, I think, uh, a word of advice from um, a care partner is with someone who's recently diagnosed is that it, it is hard. You go through a grieving process and I think everybody needs to do that and just acknowledge it, but you just grieve it. And then um, with intimacy, just mix it up, do something different. Look back at your previous intimate periods in your relationships and move forward. Um, that's, that's my words of wisdom. Thank you, Ken. That was Thank you for being so open and honest. That was very, very helpful. Um, one, one question for you, again, a very direct question. Um, do you feel worried about cat symptoms during, during intercourse? Um, I don't know if worried is um, the right feeling that I have. I'm more, much more aware and I'm much more, um, cat has some physical, uh, dystonia kind of, uh, issues in parts of her body that I'm aware of. And we have to like accommodate and make changes in our physical intercourse to, to make her more comfortable. Um, I, at first I, you know, to be honest, at first I was a little worried that I'm going to be hurting her. Mm -hmm. But uh, after being able to just communicate and, and talk about what, what, what's comfortable and what's not comfortable um, has been, is really helpful. Thank you. All right, Jean, uh, last but not least, um, Jean also um, will be talking to us about um, her experience and um, her strategies for maintaining uh, intimacy um, with in in the face of Parkinson's disease. Thank you. I've loved all the things that have been shared, and I was like, "Amen to that," and to that as well. So, um, my husband and I have been married for almost forty years. It's really quite hard to believe. When we first moved into our neighborhood, we were the newlyweds, and now we're the seniors, and it's really hard to believe that. So, as I look at the time that we have been together. Um, Parkinson's has been uh, relentlessly part of our relationship for about one quarter of that time. So during those early years that we were married, um, just to let you know, we um, have six kids. So our lives were incredibly busy. And I don't know how we managed to do it, but when um, one or both of us actually at one time were both in school and we were students and as busy parents, we knew how very important it was that we made sure that we were able to keep the romance in our relationship. We had heard about so many couples that when their kids grew up, that they would wake up and look at each other and discover that they had become strangers. And that was something that we had decided a long time ago that we didn't want that happening. And so we always prioritized by making sure that we would weekly um, have our, our dates. And sometimes they were just as simple as going out for a walk. And occasionally what we would do at least once a year, we would get away to a local hotel just so that it was close enough that we were close to home in case of an emergency, but that it was still far enough that we actually were able to just be together and not talk about the kids. Because, you know, with growing kids, it's hard not to talk about them. And this was a really good exercise for us. 
And now our last daughter got married in September and we are now officially empty nesters, which is so bizarre because it only took us 38 years before we could actually be together again. And so um, my husband retired about five years ago because of the Parkinson's and he's not retired. I mean, he is retired, but I'm not, I'm still working. I am um, a retired school teacher. I taught for over 20 years and then I went back and trained as a life coach and um, as a clinical hypnotherapist. And, and because I have my own private practice, I'm really grateful that I do have that freedom of working as much as I want, as well as as little as I want. Now, we know how challenging life can get, though. And there was just recently, I had had a very busy work week and was really looking forward to some restorative self-care for that weekend. Well, that did not last very long because I got a phone call from a friend of ours who had, um, had um, she had, um, been an addict and but she had gotten herself clean and she'd been sober for um quite a few years but she had relapsed and and then the next day we got a knock on the door and it was a friend that we hadn't seen in a while and he had um found his wife dead um that morning and was having a difficult time processing that and needed to talk and to top that off we found out that our tickets that we had booked to go down to New Mexico to spend with our eldest daughter had been canceled. And of course, you know, trying to make that work was, was quite, um, it was quite difficult. So with all those things, and we know that life happens and difficulties will come along. And so how do we stay grounded? How do we stay centered? And most of all, how do we stay connected when life happens? Because we know inevitably it will happen. So these are just a few of the things that have helped my husband and I to stay connected through the, through um, the, the difficulties. And as many have, have spoken, you know, we stay connected physically, emotionally, and intimately. So over the years, we've discovered that the two of us actually speak very different love languages. Some of you may be familiar with the book that Gary Chapman wrote about the five different love languages that help us stay connected as a couple. So my husband's main love language is touch. And I grew up in a home that where there was no touching, there was no kissing, no hugging. And so for me, it has been something that I have learned to, um, to enjoy uh, more, but I have to work at it. Whereas for him, it is his primary love language. And he really loves being touched and, and held and snuggled. And, and especially um, when, in, in, when we're having sex. And so, of course, for me, my love language is actually acts of service and words of affirmation. And as Ken was saying, um, what is really sexy is when he actually does things that help alleviate my stresses. And so, of course, we're both speaking different love languages, and that can be a little bit difficult when um, life does get in the way. So if our family size wasn't a clue, you can tell that my husband and I have always enjoyed an active sex life. But of course, um, we, as we've had to deal with the, the effects of Parkinson's, we have um, started speaking more intimately about often as as Marianne mentioned, a bit of a taboo subject. And so, of course, even with, within a, a marriage, it can be, it can feel uncomfortable and can be tabooish. And, and my husband has been really encouraging me to um, get to know my needs and my physical um my physical needs. And, and as Marianne says, you know, like sex is like one of those basic things that we need in our lives. And so of course, as we've been 
um, talking more about it. We've been experimenting more. And, and one of the things that we've discovered, and I'm sure it's different for everyone, we, there is not just one or um, way of having Parkinson's. Parkinson's shows up in so many different ways. And when my husband was first diagnosed, he was told that he had the um, good form of Parkinson's. And we had no idea that there was even such a thing. And so, of course, um, uh, we know now, you know, back then it, it was primarily tremors, but now um, there are the tremors um, and he is on medication, but now he also has difficulties with leg cramps and foot cramps and those can get in the way of having a good night's sleep. And so often um, he doesn't have a good night's sleep and that makes it really um, difficult to enjoy your day when you haven't slept well. So one of the things that has helped us is that um, learning to communicate more. Um, when we were very young, I, I heard this great, great um, definition of the word assume. Like, don't assume anything, because when you assume, you make an ASS out of you and me. And so, so often, um, we we don't talk about things just because sometimes we just you know, really get busy. And so we have learned that it is really important to, to um, talk about things, even when they're uncomfortable. And he's been encouraging me to get to know my body better. And both of us grew up in our latter teen years in a um, Christian background. So we have saved ourselves for our for, for marriage. And of course, you know, like, we just have learned a lot about our bodies. We've learned a lot about sex. We've learned a lot about, um, you know, how to adapt with um, changes in our bodies. And, and it's great to know about um, that lubrication and the difference between those things. And, and so we'll definitely have to incorporate that into our, our lives as well. But um, talking about it and just recognizing that our partners will have good days and our partners will have bad days. And one of the things that we both uh, uh, agree to is that I have given him permission to let me know when he is feeling good. And don't assume that I know that he's feeling good. To let me know that his body is feeling good, that he's not symptomatic, and that he can let me know. And I am very willing to drop what it is that I am doing. So that way we can enjoy um, intimacy without the those tremors. And, and that when they do show up, We've actually discovered that it's okay to to experiment with sex toys and vibrators and and seeing um, being open to exploration. Another thing that we've um, discovered too is how important it is to set time aside for closeness. And Esther Perel, who is a well-known sex therapist, she says that book a a a, a window of opportunity, like for at least three hours, like at least once a week. And so, yeah, it takes away from the spontaneity, but it makes sure that we're able to address things that are important to us. Now, another thing that has really helped us as well is to also not take things personally. And what I mean by that is that there are um, sometimes difficult conversations to have. And in fact, we had one of those yesterday where it was you, where I felt like, oh my goodness, I'm being a hypocrite here, but you know, we were able to work through it. Thank goodness. And, um, John Gray wrote a book years ago called Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. And he said one of the main differences between men and women is that so often, um, we as women, all we want to be heard is just, I mean, all we want is to be heard. And men often will go fix it. You know, they, they don't, just listen. And sometimes that's all we need. But I've discovered over the years, I've tended to become sort of like that too, that I tend to want to fix things. And so rather than trying to fix things, it's really important just to listen. And to, to say, you know, sometimes it's as Brene Brown says, you know, just say, thank you for sharing that with me. I can't imagine how hard that is. But you're heard. 
and I hear you, I see you, and I, I do understand. And as Ken was also saying, you know, therapy, you know, we've had years of therapy. And I think that's one of the reasons why I got into my work was so that I had the tools so that I could navigate through these difficult times. But I, I would say, though, it really helps to um, have a degree of compassion for yourselves, um, you know, for your partner, as well as for ourselves, and to really understand that this is not an easy journey, but it is a journey. If we take it together, it will be so much better. And that if we do it together, that we don't, you know, to recognize that this is also a debilitating disease. And it's not going to be easy, but let's not be defined. Our relationship doesn't have to be defined by the Parkinson's. So let's use what we've got because it's so vital and it's so important. And frankly, they say that sex keeps us living longer. We feel better and we look better. So why not, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask you a very concrete question. You talked about different love languages and the importance of communication and the communication that you've um, you've done over time with your husband. If you uh, do, you have any advice for a couple who have different lo uh, love languages? One, uh, we'll just a stereotype for a moment. The man is the one who wants more um, performance. The woman wants more the kinds of things you were just describing, uh, service and um, communication. How do you have an, a, a suggestion about what is the first step in bringing those two love languages together so that you can really help each other? Yeah, that's a great question. I think recognizing because we know how difficult it is when two people who speak different languages come together. I mean, you know, a lot of people just don't even bother, right? And I think the awareness is the first thing. And then to recognize that, that just because um, my love language is different, that there is validity in the other person's love language as well. And that it's okay to just play with it. And, um, you know, maybe they need to create like a Duolingo for love languages. <laughs> so in that way, um, you just kind of experiment and just play with it. And, and frankly, we take ourselves way too seriously sometimes. And maybe we just need to find more humor. We need to laugh more because we know laughter can make us feel better as well, too. Thank you. Well, we have a, a, a quite a few questions from our audience. Um, I'm going to start with this one, sort of a tangent from what you said with few sex makes us feel better, look better. Um, this question, and any of you that might know the answer are, are welcome to answer. Does research indicate that positive sexual activity helps lessen PD symptoms and or stress? Well, I can tell you that my husband, when he is being held, I notice how quickly his tremors seem to just subside. And last night when he was, um, we were curled up in bed together and I, can, I noticed that he was starting to kind of twitch and that always says to me that he's having difficulty. So I asked him, I said, what's going on? He said, my feet are cramping. So I put my foot on top of his foot until he felt some comfort. And then I just stroked him on his back. And I noticed that his tremors lessened substantially. And within like about five minutes, he was asleep. Nice example. Any, any other thoughts about that? Okay, um, so the next question is, um, what advice do you have when your spouse, is in my case, my husband, is frustrated and not satisfied when he is unable to climax? Does Viagra, um, he uses Viagra and has had Parkinson's for over 20 years. 
It's uh, it's probably the Viagra. Um, it can really slow down um, uh, ejaculation, and it's also a part of being older. the The advice that I that I give my patients in that situation is if they're masturbating to stop masturbating, because you can get used to, you know, masturbation is much more rough, let's say, than intercourse with a woman. You know, it's, 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 it's harder. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to, to put that, but you get, you get the idea where intercourse is this gentle touch. And so, um, if you get used to, if, if he's masturbating, if he gets used to, that's how it's supposed to feel in order to ejaculate then the intercourse isn't going to get him there. Uh, So the first thing I would do is if he's masturbating is see if he's willing to stop for like 30 days. And so that, that tender touch, that softer touch of the vagina will help. Um, The other part of it is if he could take, you know, a half a pill um, in order to get, an erection, it might be easier for him to ejaculate, but it is part of the issue with um, growing older and using those drugs. Is there any difference between Cialis and Viagra in that regard? No, no, but a critical point could be the masturbation. Thank you. Um, Ken, this question I'm going to direct to you. Um, uh, so when people, the question is really about desire and it, and for many people, if they don't have any desire, it's really hard to go on to have sexual activity. Um, do you have any strategies for a couple who are struggling with, or at least one, uh, one in the partnership is not feeling the <clears throat> same desire or any desire that they use, but but actually wants into sec- a sexual act feels like it's gratifying. Do you have any suggestions for that couple? You are muted. I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was, I was muted. So I, I heard that question as, um, any suggestions how to increase desire of your, your partner and sexual within yourself or within yourself, within yourself or, or in your partner, <laughs> either one of those situations. Um, I would, you know, my suggestion is, is to do something, try to find some, something romantic for you and to, and to set that up, like uh, go out to a nice dinner um, get dressed up, you know, make it, you know, you know, set the mood that you want and act on it. Um, and, and, and I think setting the mood for me, um, it could be like something we haven't done in a long time, you know, like going to a movie, you know, we haven't movie theaters have just opened up. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, it'd be great to go just to a movie and go out to dinner and, and make a formal date. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a suggestion I would have. Thank you. Any other suggestions? From- uh, one thing I would suggest is, you know, like the Nike commercial, just do it is to start a lot of times we can get really stuck in our heads about, oh, am I sexy enough? Oh, am I really in the mood? I... Just do it. Just start. And what will happen is that you'll start doing it and you'll say, oh, this is fun. I'm enjoying this. And at the end, I had one of my patients say, you know, once you know we do it and I I enjoy it and I said to my husband how come we don't do this more often and she said her husband just looked at her like what <laughs> you know? so but the truth of the matter is is that 
once you start, you'll, you'll be glad you did. Um, if you need to get yourself in the mood, you know, is it a warm bath? Is it maybe a, a sexy piece of, of lingerie? That can be for you as well as your partner. Um, and, you know, saying that this is my, this makes me feel good. And chances are that you're going to enjoy yourself. I used to um, think it was more about him. And then he's reminded me, no, 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 no. I want it to also be about you. So that has been something I've had to kind of learn. And I used to think that shopping for lingerie was like for your partner. But, you know, maybe it's actually for us, you know, to get us into the mood, right? So I still have to do that. <laughs> All right. Thank you. A couple of more questions. Um, uh, this one is about, uh, I will just read it to you. And Marianne, I'm, I'm going to start with you on this. Tips on how to keep physical relationships fresh and exciting when one or both partners has an unpredictable level of capability, uh, a complex situation when energy also runs low. The, the last thing that you just said, it kind of drifted out. What was the last like couple um, of words? A complex situation when energy also runs low. Oh, energy. Well, first thing is what, for the both of you, what's the time of day where you have the most energy? Is it first thing in the morning? You know, maybe you've always been used to having sex at night and you're too tired at night. Well, you know, keep the shades down if you don't really like the light and do it when you have the energy. Or if you're both retired, one of the nice things about being retired is you can take a nap together and wake up, you know, refreshed and, and, and make love. So the energy part of it, you can address that way. I'd also ask though, that if you're feeling like, oh my God, I'm just too tired Sometimes feeling really, really fatigued is part of disease. It's part of being a caretaker, but it also could be a part of feeling depressed. And maybe you need to talk to your healthcare practitioner about that. Um, was there a first part of that, Julie? I'm sorry. Um, just ways to make your physical relationship fresh and exciting. Um, well, you know, there's, there's a book out and... Um, and I know it's on Amazon because everything is. And it's something like, you know, 52 weeks of dates or something like that. And what it is, is it's a tear out book where it's, it's, you can't read it. You can't read what all of those dates are. But, you know, he rips one out, you rip one out, and then it gives you on the inside when you open it, only you can see it is, um, what do you need? What, what are the ideas, you know, what you need to buy, if it's anything, there's a little bit more expensive ones, there's a little bit cheaper ones. And so if you're like one of these people, it's like, oh my God, I'd like to do something different, but I don't know what that is. That's like a good alternative is to say, well, I'm going to, you know, and I'll find that book and I'll give it so that it can be on the website. But a lot of my patients really love that. They thought that it was a lot of fun. Um, oh, actually, I, th I did buy it and I would use it. I would say, you can take one, one sheet, you know, like in, in one of our sessions and then, you know, go buy the book for the rest of them. Um, so let me look for that. But it's a good way to keep things fresh, to keep things interesting. Um, you know, do it in a different room. If you've, if you've never made love in the kitchen, give that a try. You know, hopefully nobody's home and the family's not over, but you know, you can mix it up in a lot of different ways by just changing your location. Thank you. You've given me an idea for a stocking stuff. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, I, I like uh, what Marianne said about just start. I mean, and I also would say uh, try to surprise your partner. I mean, I, I remember last summer we went on a we went on a like a, a week and a half camping trip and we were on the tail end of it. And Kat just said, we need one more night camping. Let's just go find a place and boondock. And that was one of the most romantic, intimate, sexual experiences that we've ever had because we found a very private spot and we were outside. 
and it was something very, very different. I also would say have a sense of humor with it. I mean, don't take it so seriously uh, with your intimacy. Um, and some of the best uh, intimate moments I've had, we've had together, it, it ends with a bunch of laughter. And, uh, and that's okay. I think that's healthy. Um, well, we're, we're running out of time. It's, um, we may, I'd like to just tell the audience, we might just take a few extra minutes um, uh, be, because just to finish up here, but so please don't go away. I do have, there is one, I think, very important question that came through, um, and this will be the last one, which is, uh, this person is saying that they they do not feel their healthcare provider is very um, comfortable with this discussion of sex and intimacy, and wondering if there are suggestions about where they could go to get um, better help. That's a real common problem. I wrote a paper once a few years ago called, if you don't ask me, I'm not going to tell. Because the healthcare practitioners say, if they have a problem, they'll ask me. And patients say, well, if they have anything to offer me, they'll ask me. And so neither one of them talks about it. And it's because as a patient, we don't know exactly how do we bring up the topic. And as healthcare practitioners, they don't know how to bring up the topic and what to do about it anyway. So what you can do, though, there's the American Association of Sexuality Educators and Counselors. It's A-A-S-E-C. And if you go to their website, you can look in your state to see which people are certified um, sexual health counselors. And you can go, you know, talk with one of them because they're trained to talk about all kinds of things and work through these issues. Thank you. Um, so now I'm just going to ask each of the panel me members to um, please just um, to give us um, one take home message for the audience. And there will be um, uh, there up here on the screen. So we'll start with Mary Ann. So mine was, um, Intimacy is emotional connection with others and yourself. It's not just about your partner. It's about you. It's about what makes you feel comfortable, what makes you feel sexy, what makes you feel like you want to connect and be emotionally and physically available. I uh, can. Yeah. And, you know, my my uh, sound bite is, is grieve the Parkinson's, grieve it, go through it, and then mix it up with your intimacy, you know, rekindle some old things that you used to do and find some new things that are exciting and, and fun. And team. Use it or you lose it. And really <laughs> making priority, making connection with one another a, a priority. Because really all we've got is the gift of the present. We don't know what it's going to be like down the road. So really be in the moment and enjoy each other right here and now. Perfect. Um, I'd like to remind you again to take to take that little survey in the button in the right hand corner of your upper right hand corner of your screen. And um, I'd like to just really extend a very warm thank you to our panelists for their time, their expertise. And I want to also thank all of you viewers for joining us for asking such good questions. Um, we really hope you gain something from this session. Um, and a final thank you to our sponsors once again, Supernus and Kiwa Kieran Pharmaceuticals for, for underwriting this program and the other programs that we've been able to, to provide for you. Um, thank you for joining us today. Please stay tuned for next year's series, which is being uh, designed right now. And we'll notify you when registration is open for next year. And in the meantime, have a very safe and wonderful holiday time. I hope it's filled with good intimate moments. Where, wherever you are in the world, we look forward to having you join us and our panel discussions next year.